Section 9 of A Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. A Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy by Lawrence Stern. Section 9. The words were scarce out of my mouth when the Count de L.'s post-chaise, with his sister in it, drove hastily by. She had just time to make me a bow of recognition, and of that particular kind of it which told me she had not yet done with me. She was as good as her look for before I had quite finished my supper, her brother's servant came into the room with a billet, in which she said she had taken the liberty to charge me with a letter, which I was to present myself to Madame R., the first morning I had nothing to do at Paris. There was only added she was sorry, but from what penchant she had not considered, that she had been prevented telling me her story, that she still owed it to me, and if my route should ever lay through Brussels, and I had not by then forgot the name of Madame de L., that Madame de L. would be glad to discharge her obligation. "'Then I will meet thee,' said I, "'fair spirit, at Brussels.' "'Tis only returning from Italy through Germany to Holland, by the route of Flanders home. "'Twill scarce be ten posts out of my way, but were it ten thousand, "'with what a moral delight will it crown my journey, "'in sharing in the sickening incidents of a tale of misery told to me by such a sufferer.' to see her weep, and though I cannot dry up the fountain of her tears, what an exquisite sensation is there still left in wiping them away from off the cheeks of the first and fairest of women, as I am sitting with my handkerchief in my hand, in silence, the whole night beside her. There was nothing wrong in the sentiment, and yet I instantly reproached my heart with it in the bitterest and most reprobate of expressions. It had ever, as I told the reader, been one of the singular blessings of my life to be almost every hour of it miserably in love with some one and my last flame happening to be blown out by a whiff of jealousy on the sudden turn of a corner, I had lighted it up afresh at the pure taper of Eliza, but about three months before, swearing as I did it that it should last me through the whole journey. Why should I dissemble the matter? I had sworn to her eternal fidelity she had a right to my whole heart. To divide my affections was to lessen them. To expose them was to risk them. Where there is risk there may be loss. And what wilt thou have, Yorick, to answer to a heart so full of trust and confidence, so good, so gentle, and unreproaching? i will not go to brussels replied i interrupting myself but my imagination went on i recalled her looks at that crisis of our separation when neither of us had power to say adieu i looked at the picture she had tied in a black riband about my neck and blushed as i looked at it I would have given the world to have kissed it, but was ashamed. And shall this tender flower, said I, pressing it between my hands, 
shall it be smitten to the very root and smitten yorick by thee who hast promised to shelter it in thy breast eternal fountain of happiness said i kneeling upon the ground be thou my witness and every pure spirit which tastes it be my witness also that i would not travel to brussels unless eliza went along with me did the road lead me towards heaven in transports of this kind the heart in spite of the understanding will always say too much the letter amiens fortune had not smiled upon la fleur for he had been unsuccessful in his feats of chivalry and not one thing had offered to signalize his zeal for my service from the time that he had entered into it which was almost four-and-twenty hours the poor soul burned with impatience and the count de l's servant coming with the letter being the first practicable occasion which offered la fleur had laid hold of it and in order to do honour to his master had taken him into a back parlour in the auberge and treated him with a cup or two of the best wine in picardy and the count de l's servant in return and not to be behindhand in politeness with la fleur had taken him back with him to the count's hotel la fleur's prevenancy for there was a passport in his very looks soon set every servant in the kitchen at ease with him and as a frenchman whatever be his talents has no sort of prudery in showing them la fleur in less than five minutes had pulled out his fife and leading off the dance himself with the first note set the fille de chambre the maitre d'hotel the cook the scullion and all the household dogs and cats besides an old monkey a dancing i suppose there was never a merrier kitchen since the flood madame de l in passing from her brother's apartments to her own hearing so much jollity below stairs rung up her fille de chambre to ask about it and hearing it was the english gentleman's servant who had set the whole house merry with his pipe she ordered him up as the poor fellow could not present himself empty he had loaded himself in going upstairs with a thousand compliments to madame de l on the part of his master added a long apocrypha of inquiries after madame de l's health told her that monsieur his master was au désespoir for her re-establishment from the fatigues of her journey and to close all that monsieur had received the letter which madame had done him the honour and he has done me the honour said madame de l interrupting la fleur to send a billet in return madame de l had said this with such a tone of reliance upon the fact that la fleur had not the power to disappoint her expectations he trembled for my honour and possibly might not altogether be unconcerned for his own as a man capable of being attached to a master who could be wanting en égard vis-à-vis d'une femme so that when madame de l asked la fleur if he had brought a letter oh que oui said la fleur so laying down his hat upon the ground and taking hold of the flap of his right side pocket with his left hand 
he began to search for the letter with his right, then contrariwise. Diable! Then sought every pocket, pocket by pocket, round, not forgetting his fob. Peste! Then La Fleur emptied them upon the floor, pulled out a dirty cravat, a handkerchief, a comb, a whiplash, a nightcap, then gave a peep into his hat. Quelle étourderie! He had left the letter upon the table in the auberge. He would run for it and be back with it in three minutes. I had just finished my supper when La Fleur came in to give me an account of his adventure. He told me the whole story, simply as it was, and only added that if Monsieur had forgot, par hasard, to answer Madame's letter, the arrangement gave him an opportunity to recover the faux pas, and if not, that things were only as they were. Now I was not altogether sure of my etiquette, whether I ought to have wrote or no, but if I had, a devil himself could not have been angry. Twas but the officious zeal of a well-meaning creature for my honour and however he might have mistook the road, or embarrassed me in so doing, his heart was in no fault. I was under no necessity to write, and what weighed more than all, he did not look as if he had done amiss. "'Tis all very well, La Fleur,' said I. "'Twas sufficient. La Fleur flew out of the room like lightning, and returned with pen, ink, and paper in his hand, and coming up to the table, laid them close before me, with such a delight in his countenance that I could not help taking up the pen. I began, and began again, and though I had nothing to say, and that nothing might have been expressed in half a dozen lines, I made half a dozen different beginnings, and could no way please myself. In short, I was in no mood to write. La Fleur stepped out, and brought a little water in a glass to dilute my ink, then fetched sand and seal-wax. It was all one. I wrote, and blotted, and tore off, and burnt, and wrote again. Le diable l'emporte, said I half to myself. I cannot write this self-same letter, throwing the pen down despairingly as I said it. As soon as I had cast down my pen, La Fleur advanced with the most respectful carriage up to the table, and making a thousand apologies for the liberty he was going to take, told me he had a letter in his pocket, wrote by a drummer in his regiment, to a corporal's wife, which he durst say would suit the occasion. I had a mind to let the poor fellow have his humour. Then prithee, said I, let me see it. La Fleur instantly pulled out a little dirty pocket-book, crammed full of small letters and billets doux, in a sad condition, and laying it upon the table, and then untying the string which held them all together, run them over one by one, till he came to the letter in question. La voilà, said he, clapping his hands. So unfolding it first, he laid it open before me, and retired three steps from the table whilst I read it. The letter. Madame, je suis pénétré de la douleur la plus vive, et réduit en même temps au désespoir par ce retour imprévu du caporal 
qui rend notre entrevue de ce soir la chose du monde la plus impossible mais vive la joie et toute la mienne sera de penser à vous l'amour n'est rien sans sentiment et le sentiment est encore moins sans amour on dit qu'on ne doit jamais se désespérer on dit aussi que monsieur le caporal monte la garde mercredi alors ce sera mon tour chacun à son tour en attendant vive l'amour et vive la bagatelle je suis madame avec les sentiments les plus respectueux et les plus tendres tout à vous jacques rock it was but changing the corporal into the count and saying nothing about mounting guard on wednesday and the letter was neither right nor wrong so to gratify the poor fellow who stood trembling for my honour his own and the honour of his letter i took the cream gently off it and whipping it up in my own way i sealed it up and sent him with it to madame de l and the next morning we pursued our journey to paris End of section nine. Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey.